Hello everyone and welcome back. Tonight, me and my friend Mortis Media will keep you company with these four scary stories. Don't forget to like and share this video because it will help my channel a lot. Also, the next video will be uploaded on Tuesday, May 22nd. And also because a lot of you are asking me about this, my Patreon will be ready in the beginning of next week. I will make an announcement very soon. But for now, guys, grab your flashlight and follow me into the darkness. At the time of this story, I was a few months into an undergraduate degree in Austin, Texas, and had just become comfortable enough with myself to come out of the closet. At the time, there were no dating apps available, so to find dates, I used Craigslist, something which I would later learn would be a big mistake. I started chatting with a guy off Craigslist, Craig, and we hit it off and decided to set a time and place to meet in person. His advert said he was 27 and I was 18 at the time. At first, he was very insistent on meeting at his place, which I later found out was just a trailer and it kind of made me suspicious, but in his pictures, he was very good looking and had a nice smile, so I decided to just let it go. Eventually we agreed to get coffee before going to his place. So the day I arrived, and I went to get coffee, and was pretty excited. I had showed my roommate pictures of Craig, and talked about how I was looking forward to meeting him. I showed up to the coffee shop, and he was already there. He actually did look like his pictures, so that was a good start. We got coffee, and ended up chatting for several hours before he asked whether I wanted to go back to his place. Luckily, my roommate called to check up on me, and it also happened that he was stranded because his car had broken down. So I told Craig that I would take my friend back home before heading over to his place. Well, by the time I picked my friend up, Craig was no longer answering his phone and or texts. When he finally answered, he accused me of making up some excuse so I wouldn't have to go back to his place with him and basically was very angry and annoyed despite our great conversation earlier. I was a bit bummed, but basically didn't think of him again until years later when my old roommate sent me a link for a news article about Craig. Apparently, he had been running a sex trafficking ring, using underaged boys that he would lure through his good looks and promises. I can only imagine what would have happened to me if I'd have gone back to his trailer with him that day. Reading that article gave me serious chills. My uncle's house feels so empty since the disappearance, I can't explain it, but walking through those dusty quiet rooms, I knew right away he'd never be coming back. My own nerves were shot, it was left to us, cousins, to shift through the remains of their lives, to pack his memory in cardboard boxes, bound for some storage unit off the interstate. I was going through the closet in the master bedroom of their two-story suburban house this morning, when I found my uncle's diary. The bulb was blown in there, the cloudy sky so dim, I almost missed it, but there it was, a leather-bound book beneath a loaded shotgun and a massive pile of my aunt's shoes. I felt a need to share the last things he wrote. July 24th. There is a boy in my garden. I noticed him 
for this first time when I sat down for coffee. He was less than a shadow at first. I only notice him when I'm looking at something else, like my reheated frozen egg sandwich or the newspaper. But the more I try to look away, the stronger his presence felt. A long spreading shadow. No child looks stretched out like that. No child has such long strangle fingers or twisted feet. God, I must be going crazy. The uncle I remember would never write this way. He was the kind of guy who always had something smart to say about my nose ring. The kind of guy who would get drunk with his brothers and knock over a bowl of tortilla chips, roll on the carpet laughing and not clear up afterwards. He wasn't the sort of person who would think like this, unless it was something he saw with his own eyes. I kept reading. July 26th. He was there again, after work. Every day he gets a little closer. I swore I thought I heard him say something as I rushed from the car to the front door. I won't look behind me anymore. I won't even look at the window. I walk by at night and hear the rustling of the trees out the boulevard. It's mixed in with his voice. My wife, bless her heart, hasn't noticed a thing. Not that she would. It's been years since we've really talked about anything. My daughter just rolls her eyes as usual. Life goes on as normal, and yet, he is there. July 31st. God, what does he want? Three nights I haven't slept sleep. That awful tap-tap on the windows. Got all of them. Dusk till dawn. I was angry at first. I wanted to open the blinds. But I felt the scream start building up inside before I even got close. Freakish tall. He must be. To tap on the upstairs windows like that. He must have an over-large head like a baby's. And eyes the size of dinner plates to watch me wander from room to room. Wife asked me, what I was doing last night with the light on in the office. Told her I was reading the Bible. And I did. But the tapping. God, the tapping didn't stop. It goes on like this for a while. Rambling. He talks about how your life can go off the rails. And as long as you're going through the motions, nobody notices. He talks about feeling like a ghost in his own house. August 3rd. Took the last two days off told the family I was sick. Wife brought me some chicken noodle soup in a mug, then ran off to whatever she does during the day. I didn't like that backward glance she gave me as she shut the bedroom door, like it was some kind of freak. I am not a monster. Daughter noticed nothing, of course, too busy with those future meth heads she calls friends. I can hear her. Christ, what time is it? She came in all right yelled at me to mind my own business when I picked down the stairs, slammed the door, slammed it so hard it flew back open, and the shadow leaked in like oil. I didn't want to see what it looked like, didn't try to protect my family, I just ran to the damn closet. It's funny in a way, hilarious actually. Do they even notice? They don't notice anything. They didn't notice the drinking. Hell, Maybe I even lost control on purpose. Just to see if they'd care. I lost control too many times. That's why I had to get out of the house. It wasn't my fault. What was a kid doing in the street at 12.30 at night? And what was I supposed to do? Let one little car accident ruin my whole life? I'm an office manager, for Christ's sake. I have a wife and a kid who would confess to something no one saw. And for what? Just to spend life in prison? Fine, I did it. I pulled what was left of him off of my front bumper, wrapped him up in the trunk, and then dumped him in the woods on the other side of town. He'd a deer, that's what I told the mechanic. Life goes on. He is here now, not standing in the yard, no tapping on the window. In the house, I heard him coming up the stairs. He took his time with it like he knew I was listening, hiding in the closet like we're playing hide-and-seek. The wife and kid? Maybe they can't see him. Maybe they're all monsters, I don't know. The bedroom door is opening. 
I can hear those fingers. I never got around to greasing. At least, I've got the Remington. God, the tapping again. It's harder now. Long fingers, breaking through the door. That's where it ends. Did my uncle go crazy? Did he really kill a kid? I don't know what to think anymore. I have worked as an apprentice in a small hotel called Hotel Stardust for almost a year now. It is located right outside of Melbourne, next to an old road. When I started my apprenticeship in Hotel Stardust, the road was very busy and business here flourished. But since the new highway was opened, the amount of customers has decreased week after week. And the evening that this happened, there were only three customers here. A young couple, an old Bill, who was our regular. He liked to sit at the reception desk, drink cheap beer called Murphy's and occasionally chat with me. The hotel owner, a lovely old lady called Teresa, was sleeping upstairs. The young couple who arrived yesterday were nowhere to be seen. Me and Bill were sitting at the reception desk whilst the hall light flickered, like so many nights before. It was getting late, and I told Bill to finish his beer and get going, because I had to close the place for the night, as Bill lived in a small apartment nearby. Bill nodded and took a sip of his Murphy's, I went to close the back door. I had given the young couple a back door key and told them to come in through the back if they came to the hotel late, so I didn't really think about them. When I came back to the desk, where Bill still was, sipping his beer, the light suddenly went out. The old fluorescence had been flickering for the whole time that I had worked there, but this was the first time it had done this. I took a small flashlight from behind the desk and went to the back room. The back room lights wouldn't turn on either. I went to look through the window and saw the road lights still illuminated. Must have been the generator, I thought, and started climbing the stairs. Bill just sat there, still sipping his Murphy's. The building had three floors and a small generator room on the roof. I climbed all the way up opened the door to the generator room, and started investigating the generator. It had stopped, and whatever I tried, I couldn't understand why. Working with just a small flashlight was difficult, and investigating the generator took a long time. Just as I was almost done, I heard a noise from inside. Someone was walking in the creaky staircase. Bill? I shouted. Nothing. Just more creaking. Teresa? Still nothing. Mark? Amanda? As those were the names of the young couple, but they didn't answer either. I closed the door to the generator room, still having found no answer to why it didn't work, and went back inside. I pointed my flashlight at the staircase and nobody was there. On my right was Teresa's room. The door was shut, and on my left there was a short hallway with six rooms for guests. Most of them were always empty, but the young couple's room was also there. Room number 15. The door was wide open. Mark? Amanda? Bill shouted from downstairs. What's up? I shouted back. Um, did Mark and Amanda come back while I was up there? Nope, I didn't see anyone, Bill replied. Let me check something, I told Bill, and I slowly walked towards the open door. While checking every corner with the flashlight, I got to the door and peeked inside. It was pitch black, so I pointed my flashlight to the darkness, and to my horror, I saw myself standing in the room, staring me right in the eye, without any emotion on my face. His face? 
My face? I jumped backwards and tried to calm myself. I felt shivers down my spine. It must have just been a mirror, I thought to myself. It must be. I slowly sneaked back to the door and took another peek. The room was empty. Just the young couple's bags opened on the floor. I shined the flashlights around looking for the mirror. But I couldn't find one. I stammered the door shut and ran back to the stairs. I looked downwards and saw the reception hall. But it wasn't dark, with just Bill sitting at the desk. The hall was full of people, and there was a huge chandelier hanging from the ceiling. I didn't recognise any of the people in the hall, but they must have been guests of the hotel. Many of them had bags with them, and I stood there for a while, watching the hall full of talking and laughing people. The people's clothes didn't look modern. They looked like the clothes from an old movie. A young man next to the desk turned on his chair. Even from up here, I could see the beer bottle in his hand. I recognised the brand. Murphy's. No one else seemed to notice me, but the man next to the desk looked at me straight in the eye and winked. I closed my eyes and shook my head rapidly, and when I opened my eyes, the people had disappeared, along with the huge chandelier, and the hall was dark again. As I pointed my flashlight to the darkness, I heard the generator turn on again behind me, and the lights came back on. The old fluorescent started flickering again, and the chair next to the desk was empty. We never saw Bill again. This happened a couple of years ago, when I was a sophomore in college. I lived in an apartment complex of campus. The apartment complex was made up of multiple three-story buildings, gathered around a large swamp, a pool and a volleyball court. The buildings themselves were built so that the front door to the apartment is directly accessed from the outdoors. Each door had four identical apartments that were connected by shared balconies and exterior stairs. The apartment was set up when you walked in the front door of your apartment, to the left was the open floor plan living room and kitchen, and a hallway to the bedrooms, and to the right was the exterior wall that looked out to the balcony and volleyball court, pool, and the swamp area. We had to pay an extra $5 a month for the pool view. Bullshit, I tell you. My boyfriend Nick and I were dating long distance at the time, and he had come to visit me. We were all cuddled up in bed, finishing some movie on Netflix. It was about 12.30 at night when I figured I should take my little Yorkie out for the last time of the night. Nick asked if I wanted him to come down with me. I said no, but he wanted to come anyway. I held my dog as we walked down the stairs. We were both dressed in minimal clothing because it was too hot outside. I vividly remember how no people were around. It was a spring Friday night and no one was out on their balconies, drinking with friends. No one in the heated pool. It was just empty. It gave off a weird vibe because their apartments were full of college kids. We go to a party school and it was Friday, so something just felt off. I set the dog down and we stood about 15 yards from the base of the steps. Nick had the same weird vibe and mentioned to me, just keep a lookout. Although it was a semi-spooky night, I felt safe because Nick was there. I knew he would look out for me. I had my back turned to the swamp and was talking to him. About five minutes into potty time and suddenly he goes silent. There is a man over there. I initially thought, okay, so what? But his tone freaked me out. Later he told me what made him suspicious was a guy was wearing long pants, rubber boots, a sweatshirt with a hood pulled up, and a ball cap. Weird clothing choice for 80 degrees. I turned to look and see a man walking towards the volleyball court. That means he was also walking towards us, but there is a huge swamp between us. It rains a lot here, so it's basically a muddy mess down there, and no one ever walks through it. Unfazed. I continued talking but Nick interrupted me. Pick up the dog and go upstairs. 
Nick demanded in a low intense voice. The flat serious way he said that caused me to grab my little dog without question. I turned my head in the same direction as Nick's. The man had started walking quickly towards us, directly through the swampy ditch, closing a distance of about 30 yards. Instantly unnerved, I started past walking towards and up the stairs. I turned my head for one last glance and the man is full out sprinting at us. I let out a terrible yelp, while Nick screams, Run, he has a chain! We both begin scaling the stairs as fast as we can, taking two or three steps at a time. As we round onto the third flight, we hear the sound of his feet hitting the bottom few steps, and the distinct clang of metal hitting against the metal railing. We reach out the front door and flying it open. Thank God, we left it unlocked, and rush inside locking the deadbolt. Nick screams, get a knife. I run to the kitchen, grab two, and return to the front window, where we can see the man running away between two neighbor buildings. At this point, the only roommate that was home comes out of her room, confused. I fill her in as Nick calls the cops. About five minutes later, the apartment's residence cop was at our door. He talked to us for a couple of minutes before going out to look for the guy. Twenty minutes later, the cop returns. He said he didn't find the guy, but he found out two feet of heavy-duty chain near the buildings we saw him run off between. I have no idea what he would have done if he had caught us, or how the night would have turned out if I had gone down the stairs alone. Hey there, and thank you so much for listening. If you like this video, please leave a thumbs up, and if you like my videos and want to see more, subscribe to my channel, and I will see you all in my next video.